Hello and welcome everyone to the Certified Pediatric Nurse CPN exam webinar covering how to use the exam content outline and tips to prepare and increase confidence. We're so glad you're here. My name is Leslie Lightfoot and I am the Manager of Exam Development at PNCB. I've been with PNCB since 2009 and work uh, through those years, it's been a privilege to work on all PNCB exam programs and their production processes. One of my greatest joys, though, is working with the many cohorts of volunteer subject matter experts who are integral to each part of that process. So with that, I am pleased to be joined by a wonderful CPN and volunteer friend of PNCB, Siobhan Nelson. Siobhan? Hello everyone, uh, my name is Siobhan Nelson and I currently manage an acute care uh, cardiac and transplant unit at Seattle Children's Hospital. Uh, I initially joined PNCB as an item writer in 2015, which is about two years after taking the exam. And um, thanks to Leslie and her team, I've participated in various projects since then. And um, anyways, I'm just very excited to present today. So thank you for having me. Thanks Siobhan. Just a few housekeeping items. We are recording, uh, so we can share this recording with you and others later. Uh, the mute is already on, and uh, we're gonna cover a lot of ground with this presentation. Uh, and with the content that we share, we hope to answer any questions you may be thinking along the way. So please do save those questions until closer to the end and pop them in the Q&A box at that time. We have a couple of moderators behind the scenes that will help share questions uh, at appropriate segments. And if you experience any tech issues, go ahead and use that Q&A box to let us know that as well, and we'll, we can try to help. Both Siobhan and I have no financial disclosures to report, and uh, with this presentation, we're just obligated to share that with you. The purpose of this presentation and webinar event is to support you as you strive to achieve the CPN credential uh, and demonstrate that you're an expert in pediatric nursing care. We're rooting for you, you can do it. We wanna wish you luck um, and we want you to uh, obtain that CPN credential. So this presentation and all sorts of um, things that we're gonna share within it, hopefully will um, assist you with that. So we recently conducted a survey on CPN exam readiness with nurse, nurse educators and mentors. And results of that survey uh, indicated that about 50% of those nurse educators or mentors reported that they feel RNs lacked a bit of confidence, which impacted their readiness to want to apply and ultimately test the CPN exam. So let's try to change that st statistic. This webinar shares strategies to support a thoughtful uh, CPN study plan. A couple of learning objectives and overview before we really dive in. Um, this presentation, we're going to explain how the CPN exam content outline is developed based on uh, evidence from current pediatric nursing practice uh, and research. We're going to describe how to incorporate the content outline into your personalized study plan, because we know one size does not fit all. We're going to identify resources and strategies to increase confidence in a study plan developed and we're gonna review updates to the content outline, which go into effect October 25th, 2022. But some facts first. Uh, PNCB has a vibrant community of over 31,000 CPNs in practice in a variety of areas. Many of you listening now may have already applied for the exam or maybe planning to. So we're so glad that you're here with us for this review. The exam itself is three hours in duration. It consists of 175 questions, of which 150 are scored and 25 are pretest or unscored. And we'll go into that a little bit more in the presentation later. Um, we're also very delighted to report that two of our exams, CPN being one of them, are offered in a live remote proctoring experience or environment. So you have the choice of where you'd like to test when you apply at a testing center or uh, via live remote proctoring. Let's talk about eligibility. So current CPN exam eligibility requires, you know, of course, an active current unencumbered RN license, and then um, pediatric RN clinical experience. It can be direct or indirect care. 
So there's two pathways there, and we'll go over uh, each of them just a little bit. Most applicants are going to use this first pathway, which is our longest standing option for CPN um, applying, of 1,800 hours of pediatric clinical RN experience completed in the last two years. Um, the second pathway or alternative pathway, if you can't meet those 1,800 hours of recent experience, is a minimum of five years as an RN in pediatric nursing and 3,000 hours in pediatric nursing within the last five years with that minimum of 1,000 hours within the past two years. In terms of hours to meet eligibility requirements, remember that pediatric nursing residency program hours count too. Additionally, the exam is not just for direct care RNs, uh, ambulatory, public health, home health, and school-based health roles would also be eligible too. And as just mentioned, uh, those required practice hours can be direct or indirect care like teaching or research. And then lastly, as a candidate, you aren't limited to having a BSM. MSNs, DNPs, ADNs, and nursing diplomas would also qualify. All right, everyone, it's time to grab some comfy shoes because I'm about to walk you through the CPN content outline. And um, just a sneak preview, it has a lot of very rich content. So um, bear with me as we go through all the good stuff here. So here is the infamous CPN content outline. Um, this is truly an essential tool to reference when you're preparing for the exam. Kind of a don't leave home without it sort of thing. Um, it lists every topic that's covered, and it's really a blueprint for the CPM exam. Uh, this first page here that you can see, it provides an overview of the four domains and also tells you how many questions or also known as items are in each of those domains on the test. And just in my work, um, I strongly encourage all of my RNs that are looking to get their CPN um, to download or print this so they can use this as a guide um, when they are developing their study plan. Yes, it's the number one tool. It's a must have. All right, so uh, you may be wondering, where do they come up with this stuff? And if you are, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, PNCB is required to conduct national, national research every three to seven years in order to provide a national certification exam. Um, so this is referred to as National Job Task Analysis Research, and it surveys current CPN certificates and other pediatric experts in the field. Um, this research asks what topics must be covered that, to ensure that someone is competent in that field. And uh, some of the questions are, how frequently do we see this in our practice? How important is this topic to good patient outcomes? Um, and really, the takeaway of this is everything on the outline has been validated by research and reflects what pediatric nurses are doing in their daily practice. So this research was last conducted in uh, 2021, and it usually takes about six to nine months to conduct this research, so it's not a small task. Um, this recent one, we had about a thousand active pediatric nurses that responded, and they ranked the clinical categories which we will talk about shortly, the importance of the tasks, the frequency of the tasks, and all this is based on their own practice. Okay, so how does the survey influence the outline itself, since we're here to talk about that? Um, once it's collected, the survey information is then reviewed by experts of this, the committee I talked about before, the JTA committee, and is then applied to the exams. And really the point of all this is for PNCB to maintain accreditation and to ensure that you're proficient in current pediatric practice. So it's really important to, tr to truly study all areas of the content outline to be successful on the exam. Regardless of your experience, it will not be enough to just study one area of the outline. The exam tests your ability to apply knowledge to apply the knowledge that you already have and then use it for critical thinking. So every exam has questions at the recall, application and analysis levels, but each one is designed to identify nurses who have the knowledge and can then use the critical thinking to find the one best answer. So these are the four categories. We also call them domains um, that are on the exam. They cover areas like health promotion, assessment, which is also the largest section you can see there, 
planning and management and professional responsibilities. And you will note that the number of questions per domain and also the percentage um, are detailed in this chart. So that also kind of can guide your studying. Um, and I really highly recommend that you kind of consider this chart when developing your study plan. All right, so we're gonna jump right on into the meat of it here. So this is domain one, which is your health promotion. Uh, I'm gonna highlight a few things to familiarize you with the kinds of the, the content that will be covered here. And um, also just as a reminder again, regardless of what we cover in this webinar, it's important to review each task in every single domain. There's a lot of content and I would hate for you to miss something. So this domain actually has three subdomains, and the first of which is focused on tailoring health promotion activities based on factors that influence the health of the child, family, and or community. So this covers content about customizing the health promotion plan with regards to factors like genetic and environmental influences. Uh, the second domain focuses on providing anticipatory guidance and education across the pediatric age continuum for the child, family, and or community. And as you can see, this is a bigger section. It's further separated into many categories that pertain to where like every place that the child like lives, learns, and plays. So growth and development covers topics such as like infant bonding and puberty. Um, injury prevention covers topics like safe sleep, bicycle safety, gun safety, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the building resilience and healthy coping is new to the outline. Uh, and I just want to note that, uh, as you can see, some of the uh, items there list examples of what is included in that specific task. But please know that it's not comprehensive of what's in there. And it's really just there to um, help define the task a little bit better. Um, and then lastly, for this page, we are moving on to referring the child and family to community resources, which really encompasses resources like early intervention programs, uh, referrals to behavioral health providers, and social services. So one suggestion um, for studying is if you work mostly with adolescents, you may be very comfortable talking about sexual health and maybe even partner violence. But instead, you may want to spend a little extra time brushing up on infant nutrition, probably not your forte. So, um, of course, I just want to reiterate again, these are suggestions and they are not indicative of specific topics or questions on the test, but just kind of my personal little tidbit for you. All right, as we transition to domain two, you notice that it's all about the first step in the nursing process, the right? assessment. So it's also broken down into two subdomains, the physical and psychosocial. So from obtaining um, a health history, which includes admission assessments for you inpatient folks, to determining an accurate pain score using the appropriate tool, um, this section covers really all the ways that we gather data to develop a meaningful care plan for a child's physical health. Um, if you commonly see patients that have developmental delays, it may be helpful for you to review what are the expected developmental milestones? Um, and that may help you better prepare for task number two, which is assess growth parameters and developmental milestones. Um, another little tidbit is, have you ever performed a visual acuity test on a toddler? It's not as easy as you would think. Um, and if you haven't, then maybe task number six might be an area that we'd wanna spend a little more time on. I'm just gonna reiterate again, uh, that these suggestions are examples, but not indicative of specific things on the tests. Just little tips for you. All right, so onto the psychosocial assessments, we um, will be assessing the child's environment. So like home, school, daycare, et cetera. Um, consider how do you identify cultural and spiritual practices that influence and impact the child's health um, when you're providing care? This also covers uh, assessing the impact of any adverse childhood experiences. Um, you may also know these as ACEs, uh, as well as social determinants of health. Um, as you may know, there's increasing awareness of these topics, which is why they're also a new addition to this domain. Um, I want you to think about assessing the dynamics of the family, the risk-taking behaviors like substance use and risk factors like human trafficking, for example. 
And as nurses, how do we recognize acute stressors that are impacting the family? What are their coping mechanisms? How are they adjusting to acute and, and chronic conditions they're experiencing? Um, are there any barriers to following the plan of care for the family? And what educational needs does a child or family have? All right, so into domain three, we transition to planning and management. Also has three subdomains. The first is uh, acute and chronic care for physical and behavioral health needs. And really this is where you take all of those assessment pieces you just did and um, in combination with diagnostic results, um, formulate a comprehensive and collaborative care plan. So using developmental appropriate non-pharmacological techniques to manage pain, utilizing equipment and technology appropriate for the needs of the child. Um, this may include you know, all the various kinds of pumps that we use, STDs, ventilators, all that um, tech stuff. Um, are you modifying the plan of care based on the child's response? I mean, we all know that every child is different and often responds differently to the same treatments. Uh, are you integrating complex care needs into the plan of care? Um, this could in include like the use of a sensory board, um, creating a low stim environment, providing motor appropriate activities uh, that are really specific to that child, um, facilitating op optimal nutrition throughout illness and recovery. Um, you may know this could be very challenging for those picky eaters. So uh, it's not an easy task sometimes. Uh, then we also have performing procedures and interventions as appropriate for the plan of care. So you may know that placing an NG tube is very different with a neonate versus an adolescent. So um, just consider the various techniques that you would use for each patient population. Uh, we also have maintaining a safe environment. So whether that's keeping the crib rails up for an infant or performing a room search on a suicidal patient, um, how, what are all the things that we do to keep our patients safe, regardless of the setting that they're in? And we also have develop and implement the transfer of care. So this could include handoff within your own team or maybe transition to the big brave world of adult care. All right, the second part of domain three is psychosocial and child or family-centered care. So think about how you're incorporating their cultural and spiritual needs in the plan of care. How are you integrating gender identity and sexual health into the plan of care? What strategies are you using to address the barriers to care? Uh, how do you adjust your communication to meet the developmental and learning needs of the family? What ways are you um, providing developmentally appropriate uh, support and preparation for procedures? Uh, are you providing play activities that are appropriate for the child's developmental level? Because really the child's job is play depending on their age. And uh, how are you adjusting the plan of care to incorporate the family's needs, values, and priorities, all in collaboration with the child and family? Um, are you evaluating their readiness for discharge, uh, providing education, really big one there? Uh, are you um, integrating trauma-informed care principles into your care? Um, do you know what those principles even are? Uh, and consider how we support a family through grieving and loss. So uh, again, if you're not familiar with any of these tasks or it's kind of a rusty topic for you, you may want to think about focusing a, a little more time on them while you're preparing for the test. So palliative and end-of-life care wrap-up domain three. Uh, we have providing guidance for um, uh, an anticipation of progression for the condition and treatment options. So um, what should the family and patient expect to see in the next few hours, days, or weeks as their disease evolves? Promoting quality of life for the child and family. Um, like, is respite care an option? Could the child benefit from play therapy? Are they in a place that that is appropriate? Um, supporting end-of-life decision-making. So this may be advocating for family presence um, or educating on what hospice care kind of looks like. And then we also have managing care and needs um, throughout the dying process. So what kind of support do the caregivers need um, at this time? And how are we educating families on uh, the impact of pain management through that dying process? All right, and the final domain has only 13 questions 
and it's all related to professional responsibilities of the pediatric nurse. So topics here include advocating for the child and family, um, and then also advocating at the system and governmental level for policies that support children and families. Um, and an example that came to mind for this one is uh, how some states fought for laws to improve patient ratios that are even like specific to pediatrics. So that could be one way you're advocating. Uh, we have identifying and addressing ethical and legal considerations related to pediatric practice, um, such as the age-specific right to confidentiality care with some sensitive services like mental health, sexual health, uh, maintaining professional boundaries in therapeutic relationships, which um, is becoming increasingly challenging with the widespread use of social media. Uh, not only are your patients looking for you sometimes on social media, but sometimes their caregivers as well. Um, so how do we keep those boundaries and keep you safe? Um, so as the nursing field experiences really mounting levels of burnout, there is a focus uh, now on recognizing the need to support not only yourself, um, but your colleagues in response to stressful events. Some of you are experiencing that on a daily basis. Um, and then when prioritizing care across the patient assignment, you're really identifying the, the clinical priorities, but also adapting your plan as the needs change, trying to cluster care if possible, um, and then also delegating appropriately. And then lastly, we have um, engaging in interdisciplinary collaboration to provide comprehensive care. Um, an example would be prioritizing rounds and discussing patient needs from um, the nursing perspective. All right, so the outline also has a, a couple different sections too. Um, the outline has very helpful prioritized list of the most frequently encountered clinical conditions you can see here with these cute little organs, love them. Uh, respiratory and GI are really always at the top and they're always duking it out for the number one spot. Um, and what this means for you is you, you're gonna see more questions related to these conditions than any other on the exam, hands down. Um, behavioral and mental health, uh, jumped from number 13 up to number three based on the research. Uh, and uh, maybe Leslie can confirm later, but this I think is the biggest jump we've ever experienced in a clinical condition, uh, which also just speaks to how um, prevalent and important it is right now. Um, infectious disease and neurology are following after that and so forth. Uh, at the very end, we have child maltreatment and neglect followed by allergy, immunology, and rheumatology. Um, there are less questions on the exam um, regarding these conditions, but I just want to make sure you don't forget about them because there likely will be questions about them on your exam. So the other section uh, has a list of procedures and interventions that may be covered on the exam as well. Um, these, uh, on the other hand, are listed alphabetically and have no priority in this list in any kind of way. So this includes temperature regulation, fluid and electrolyte administration, uh, a new item of infection prevention, and the use of PPE was added due to the increased, increased frequency that we are utilizing these in our care. Thank you, COVID. Um, there are multiple types of lines and tubes to maintain, such as urinary devices, NG tubes, chest tubes, pick lines, et cetera. Um, and then my personal favorite, medication administration. This can Always be a fun one if you're down for an adventure. Always depends on the age of the kid, but it spurs creativity. Um, we then have nutrition support, uh, psychological monitoring, positioning, and then the renamed preventative safety measures, which includes things like seizure precautions and fall prevention. And then lastly, we have um, skin and wound care, specimen collection, and wound care testing. And another personal favorite, suctioning, huge fan. Um, if any of these are foreign or unfamiliar to you, again, you may wanna give a little extra time to them in your study plan. All right, so let's talk about medication names. Hopefully that didn't give you any palpitations. You're gonna be great. Um, so PNCB is very cognizant of the kind of names they use on the exam. Um, and here's why. Um, did you guys know that Lasix is technically a brand name that no longer exists? Sit on that for a second. It completely blew my mind. Um, how often are we saying Lasix when really we mean uh, ferrosamide? Well, now all the time because Lasix doesn't exist. 
Um, and since these kind of changes, you know, companies go out of business, they get bought out, et cetera, um, changes to brand names can change anytime. So PNCV will always include the generic name of any medication mentioned on the exam. There may be times where both the generic and brand name are used, um, but really the takeaway is just, you need to know the generic name of the common pediatric medications for the exam. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the things that have changed, but if you're wondering like comprehensively what's changed, don't worry, it's really not much to be honest. And the big takeaway is you do not need to study differently regardless of whether you're taking it now or later. So um, all the tasks that were on the outline previously were retained and either reworded or kind of reorganized or kind of refocused depending on um, the topics. So there's no advantage to taking, to taking the exam that's built from one outline to another um, and no need to have any preparations uh, that are different because it's going to benefit you just fine and equally. Um, and just to call out, the reference list is still the same as well. So no need to go out and buy uh, new things because it hasn't changed. So there are a few procedures and interventions though that no longer met the threshold to remain on the exam. And this includes blood administration, phototherapy, procedural sedation, and restrictive interventions. And then inversely, a few new tasks have joined the outline. So um, as I mentioned before, these include the building resilience and healthy coping in the health promotion domain. And then growing topics in the assessment domain were added and they include assessing the child's environment for developmental, cognitive and physical needs and also assessing the impact of adverse childhood experiences, those ACEs, um, and social determinants of health. And then in planning and management domain, uh, two more tasks were added. So the first one recognizes the seat that nurses have at the table here. So that's collaborating with members of the team to contribute to an accurate medical diagnosis. And the second focuses on how we can decrease the impact of psychological trauma and promote um, empowerment of the patient by integrating trauma-informed care principles. And then in the uh, professional responsibilities domain, there are new tasks for advocating at the system and governmental levels for policy changes and engaging in interdisciplinary collaboration to provide um, comprehensive care. You may notice that more tasks that we added are related to collaboration, which really speaks to how integral the nurse is to the care team and um, also how important communication is. So. That is that, and I will turn it back over to Leslie. Thank you so very much, Siobhan. Uh, so Siobhan has covered what's been added, edited slightly, or removed from one outline to the next, and now I will offer a breakdown of how the content domain structure has been updated slightly with the outline that will go into effect in late October 2022. So just a quick side-by-side -side comparison. One of the main um, you know, differences that you can probably see is uh, there are three content domains on the left, health promotion, assessment, and management, and there are four uh, on the right, the uh, outgoing 2017 outline and the incoming 2022 outline. But as, as Siobhan was mentioning, even though it's kind of be, been rearranged or resorted differently, it hasn't changed all that much. Um, you'll notice in the outgoing outline, professional responsibilities was kind of baked into that management category and item counts there, where it's pulled out back into its own content domain with a dedicated number of items in the updated outline. So that's one of the main differences. Kind of by the numbers or by the percentages, again, the outgoing on the left, the incoming uh, on the right, um, it gives you the percentage of exam content, scored exam content that you'll experience when you take the CPN exam. Um, and uh, it has the percentage, health promotion 23%, which equates to 34 items that you would be scored on in that health promotion category, um, assessment 53 items, planning and management 50 items, uh, and then uh, that professional responsibilities category, which has been pulled out again, 13 dedicated items for that. Each you know, content outline doesn't change in terms of 150 scored items. 
So a little bit more about that. The whole exam, again, is 175 questions. 150 of those questions are scored and they were, are broken out or allocated in those content uh, domain areas that we just spoke about. There's 25 additional items to get to that 175 that are pretest questions or unscored questions. Um, there is no way to determine which to you, the candidate, which are scored and which are unscored. So it's so very important that as you are experiencing your testing event that you answer all 175 questions presented on the exam. Um, anytime anyone takes uh, this exam or any PNCB exam, there is this subset of unscored items that we need to you know, collect statistics on, validate that they are valid and good questions to then advance them to scored status. So they're there, you don't know which ones are which, so do remember to answer all questions you are presented with uh, on your exam. So will the exam include COVID questions? Uh, we've gotten that uh, inquiry from time to time. Clearly COVID you know, has been and is extremely prevalent, um, you know, but in terms of being represented on the exam, why we did ask about COVID and its impact on CPNs as we were conducting this national research, um, we did not collect data on frequency or management um, of the condition. So Infectious disease uh, is a clinical conditions category that is represented on the outline, but you know until uh, COVID is referenced in foundational textbook references on our recommended resource list, you're not going to encounter um, those kind of questions and we'll find other infectious disease related questions on the exam. So some tips for the future. The content outline, it's definitely a thorough review of pediatric RN knowledge, but it can be used for more. So other ways that one could use the CPN exam content outline could be a checklist for precepting, uh, perhaps a resource for undergraduates or even a residency or new hire tool. So just something to keep in mind. Let's walk through a couple of resources now. In addition to that number one study tool, the content outline, there is a whole host of other uh, resources available on PNCB's website at that web address listed there at the bottom of this slide. There is a readiness checklist, a reference list, uh, practice test modules, a test taking strategies resource that focuses on um, test taking anxiety some non-PNCB resources and where to find them, and five free sample questions written the style of uh, the CPN exam item. So let's talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail. The readiness checklist is quite literally a roadmap from your eligibility, the time that you become eligible after you apply for the exam, all the way to test day. This is a great downloadable resource that you can find on our website. And one of my favorite parts about it is that kind of column on the left where you can check off things as you do them. I like checks. Um, so it gives you links and reminders about the content outline that we've been talking about in great detail. Um, it gives you, uh, you know, links and information about the reference list. It helps you or prompts you um, to perhaps infuse certain things into an individualized structured study plan. Um, so we encourage you to find that and download that if you haven't already. The reference list. Uh, so we do have a list of recommended references for the CPN exam on our website. There is no need to study them all. Um, what we recommend is that you pick one familiar textbook uh, and use that kind of in your, uh, you know, the core of your studying. This listing of recommended references are what our CPN exam item writers and CPN exam committee members who are in a role to, to pulling the content uh, together uh, as part of the process find the most useful for their work. All items that you will encounter on your CPN exam are referenced from a foundational um, textbook reference. So this is an important list if you haven't visited it already. Uh, and just a disclaimer, generally, we cannot endorse a specific text and we have no financial relationship with any textbook or publisher. A couple of tips when using references. Um, it's a semi-large list. Again, you needn't get, get all of them. Pick one. Um, some ideas if you don't uh, you know, want to go out and purchase one or more, check your hospital or employer's library. Uh, are there textbooks floating around on the unit? Perhaps 
visit a public library, uh, alumni access to university library. We also would recommend as you are searching uh, for a book to use in your personalized study plan that try to find a most current edition of any of those references if at all possible. So practice test modules, um, a quick disclaimer, these aren't study or review courses, um, but PNCB does pull together and offer uh, several practice test modules that are available in our marketplace. Right now we have three modules available, they're optional, um, but a great aspect of these modules uh, is that they are written in PNCB style, the same kind of style that you'll encounter when you go and take the actual CPN certification exam. They're written by CPN subject matter experts who are trained in item writing and PNCB style. Uh, and the two uh, practice test modules that are 50 questions each with in-depth rationales are $35. And then there's an additional 100 question drill that does exactly kind of what it says. It's just 100 more questions to drill. There's no in-depth rationale statements there. It's just an additional set of items, again, written in the style of our exam items, and that's at $50. So if you're interested in those, we encourage you to visit our marketplace uh, to learn more. If you are interested in using them, and perhaps you already have one or more, here are a few tips on how to use them. So practice tests alone aren't going to prepare you for the exam. They really should be a supplemental tool as you are pulling together your own individualized, personalized um, you know, study plan that works for you. They are diagnostic tools to use after you've spent a little bit of time on your own studying. And a, and a friendly reminder, they are for individual use only, not group activities. So when you um, you know, purchase them and access the content. The questions will randomize. You can print out, um, you know, your personalized feedback reports for your continued use uh, as a, and a resource as you prepare for your exam day. So one um, kind of suggestion would be to use one of them early in your studies. Take the practice test in a single sitting to try and simulate the exam experience. It might only be 50 questions, and we know that the full exam is 175 questions, but consider timing yourself. Um, go through all 50 questions. Wait to grade the questions until the end. On every screen, you're going to have the ability to either reveal the key or not. Perhaps with that first go or run through, you just answer them. Go all the way to the end and see how you do. How long did it take you? What was your score? Review your feedback report. It'll show you where you may be weak uh, by content domain area and focus extra study time on those areas. Fast forward to, to when you get a little bit closer to test day, take it again. It's going to be the same set of questions, but with each attempt, it shuffles for you. It randomizes them. Uh, answer a few questions at a time and choose to reveal the answer key you know, with each of those. That in-depth rationale statement is gonna pop up to show you not only why the correct answer is correct, but why the incorrect answers aren't correct. And that type of um, you know, kind of in-depth review will help you understand you know, why is the question even being asked? What is important about it? What's the takeaway? A note about review courses. So again, PNCB does not provide its own review course or review textbook. That would be a conflict of interest uh, as we administer the exam. However, we do have this great area on the CPN resources webpage uh, to include questions on what to consider if you're looking for a review course or resource outside of uh, PNCB. So check that out if you're interested. Now let's increase your confidence in studying and testing. Back to that all important content outline. All CPN exam questions that will be on the test that you take are based on that outline. Each question that you're tested on directly links to a specific content domain health promotion, for example, and a task beneath it. So it's important that you study all areas of the CPN outline as you uh, form your plan and you prepare. So here's an example. A question is asking to select the most developmentally appropriate toy for a hospitalized toddler. 
that would be mapped to or connected to the task statement uh, three, domain three, task B, subtask six under the planning and management domain. So some tips to use the outline. Again, go through the entire outline from top to bottom. Perhaps pull out a couple of highlighters if you're a paper person or highlight a PDF of the outline. Identify what content you're most familiar with. And then similarly, content that you're not as familiar with. You're gonna to wanna to focus, obviously, right? A little bit more study time on the ones that you aren't familiar with. We suggest perhaps that you ask a clinical educator for resources or ask a colleague experienced in that area for some pointers in their practice. Try to create a study plan. And here's just a few ideas or ways that you can do that, some of which you might already be doing. Put dedicated study days on your calendar. Uh, sometimes, you know, we hear that shorter, more frequent study periods could be more productive for your learning style. Try to build in an extra day or two at the end of your eligibility period right before you test um, for some additional studying. But we recognize, as you do probably, that not one size fits all um, as you're creating this customized study plan for yourself. So let's dive in even more. One idea to consider is creating SMART goals for yourself. Uh, SMART goals um, are, are goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, um, and timely. SMART goals could help you push your uh, study preparations a little bit further. It adds structure. They add structure and clarity around a plan that you're creating. Uh, it gives you a sense of direction and purpose with your studies. And um, quite frankly, it'll give you a feeling of accomplishment as you check off uh, bite-sized goals as you're preparing to test for the CPN exam. Let's take a, a look at a couple of examples of a SMART goal as it relate or as they could relate to the content outline. So remember we highlighted some weak areas on the content outline, right? The ones where you know you have to study a little bit more. For any of those weak areas, here's a SMART goal example. I will uh, seek out at least one recent uh, continuing education activity from a respected source to increase my knowledge. I will ask my educator for additional ideas to support that weak area and I'll complete each week area within one week's time. Another SMART goal example. Remember that list of procedures and interventions in the outline? For that list of procedures and interventions, I will use a recommended reference list textbook to review the topic. Just one of them, just pick one. A lot about 15 to 30 minutes per procedure or intervention and complete this task for five of those within one week. Last SMART goal example, uh, for content area 2A, physical assessment. I will brush up on the topics listed using a textbook on the recommended reference list, allow myself 30 minutes per topic, and then complete all those topics in my first two weeks of preparations. So moving on to another resource we offer, we have a test taking strategies and test anxiety free PowerPoint uh, resource. It's downloadable, you can print it, um, and it essentially goes over all sorts of nuggets, tips and tricks on exam preparation, some of which we're discussing today. Uh, it goes into a little bit about test anxiety, um, what to do or to consider on your exam day, you know, up until, being hydrated, allowing enough time to drive to a test center if that's your chosen modality, enough sleep, um, things like that. And then a few tactics for answering multiple choice exam questions, which could be helpful. Again, it's a free resources. We encourage you to download it if you haven't already. Another thing that we would suggest is to get support. It kind of seems intuitive or obvious, but add this to your list. Um, ask family and friends to babysit or perhaps help in other ways so you can focus on your study plan that you've created. Um, maybe you want to form a study group with other applicants. Um, you might want to find a mentor who's passed the CPN exam and is willing to share strategies on how they studied. Um, another idea is to consider seeking guidance with clinical educators and other staff development teams. Perhaps you even want to connect with a local SPN uh, resource or members that you know. 
setting boundaries is also important. Um, you know, consider picking a very specific, quiet place to study where you know that you can concentrate and be effective in your studies and preparation. Bring only the study items you need there. Try to step away from the phone if you don't need it and minimize or minimize, excuse me, social media. You could even consider a web blocker app to really focus what you're looking at electronically and not get distracted. Back to that family and friends uh, and getting support there. Have them know what you're up to and be on board to respect your study time. And just a handful of more ideas, because um, we, we want to give you everything we got, you know, in terms of, of ideas to help you pre prepare. So the growth and development um, area of the continental could be more challenging, right, uh, for a hospital-based RN. So consider inviting a child life specialist to speak on ages and stages and developmental milestones. Just an idea. Uh, if you're in a subspecialty, consider exploring rounds in other areas or units. If you're in med surge, try to connect with subspecialty colleagues. Um, it could also, if you have a study group, you know, arranged, perhaps inviting or pulling together a panel of CPNs who felt that their own study plans were a pretty strong factor uh, in their success in testing and have them share tips and tricks. And then we have to have a little fun, right? Uh, consider making a game out of some of your, your study and preparation. Think Jeopardy, bingo, trivia teams, you know, be creative as you uh, really pour over that content outline and think of ways that you can um, increase your study and knowledge there. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the uh, content outline, your study plan, perhaps even connecting with colleagues. We just talked about that or educators for study tips and tricks. But here is what we need to point out uh, in terms of what people can say and can't say about the exam. Um, so we have created this awesome toolkit. It's called Ethics and Testing because Exam ethics are really everyone's responsibility and their personal responsibility. So we have this wonderful toolkit to help you understand what can be discussed and what can't be discussed as you prepare for the exam, take the exam, uh, and uh, you know have that relationship with the exam and your credential. Here's a couple of things in the toolkit, um, and I won't go into too much detail about all of them, but you can find all of this and more at pncb.org slash exam hyphen ethics. There's a free CE module where you can earn one contact hour learning about ethics and testing. There's a quiz. Um, there are some infographic resources. Uh, if you only have two minutes or so as part of your study plan, we invite you to review this video uh, about exam ethics. It's really quite wonderful. It's a, it's a um, cartoon-esque video, but it's, it's really a wonderful journey, you know, of a nurse, of a candidate, explaining, again, what is okay to ask or what is okay to hear and what is not okay to say. And it puts it in very, um, you know, kind of clean terms. So thank you in advance for upholding PNCB's code of ethics as you uh, experience this journey of becoming a CPN. So when you registered for this event, we gave you the opportunity to ask some questions ahead of time. And we gathered some of those questions and have them here that we'll go ahead and um, answer for everyone, because hopefully more than one person is probably thinking of the same question. Question number one, are the questions asked in different ways once you get it wrong the first time? No. Questions don't repeat on an exam form or across multiple exam forms. So unlike NCLEX's adaptive testing, the CPN exam will not shut off or stop or alert you when a certain number of right or wrong answers are reached. So this goes back to there's 175 questions. You will want to answer all of the questions on the exam form you receive. Why are the questions so tricky? Well, the answer is we never um, you know, work with our subject matter experts to author items intended to trick or fool the learner, right? A psychometrically sound accredited exam program must present questions that offer plausible but incorrect answer options along with one correct answer among the choices listed. And this method truly does distinguish between candidates who have the knowledge to get that question right and candidates who don't. Can a new grad nurse become a certified RN? 
Well, the CPN exam is experience based, so a required number of hours need to be completed to be able to apply. So do visit that exam eligibility page to review both of those pathways if you have any questions there. Is this exam best for outpatient specialty care? So in recent years, the number of CPN candidates um, has increased uh, you know, in that outpatient practice area. So it's true also for those passing the exam. You know, we definitely are seeing more of an interest in home health and community-based care. We just wanna keep driving you back to that content outline for topics uh, and just to review everything from top to bottom on that outline and reach out to us if you have any questions. What about live remote proctoring? So just a quick reminder and overview here that we are so pleased to offer testing options for the CPN exam in both physical testing centers and via live remote proctoring. So take a read, visit our website, consider each modality uh, and which is right for your comfort, comfort level and schedule and apply accordingly. Another question, how much time should we spend studying prior to the exam? Well, we wish we had a perfect answer for this, um, but as we've chatted about and talked about and walked through, everyone truly is different, you know, when it comes to how they prepare, uh, what they need to prepare for the CPN exam with different levels of familiarity with each um, area of the content outline. So even if you complete a review course, you're still going to want to create and follow a study plan. It's important to uh, really embrace and adopt a well-rounded approach to your study preparations. Can I see what answers I get wrong on the exam? No. Sharing questions and their answer would compromise exam security. So even staff cannot discuss questions or answers with you. What I can share, if you happen to be unsuccessful, on your CPN exam attempt, you will receive um, a notification uh, you know, with your results that go into a little bit of detail uh, in terms of the content domains and whether you performed below, at, or above in that area with, with some guiding comments of how you could focus your study preparations if you uh, intended to reapply. Okay, so now we're gonna pause just for one moment to see what kind of questions you're asking in the Q&A area. Allow me just one moment while I pop those questions open. And it looks like we have several that have already been kind of back and forth answered. Um, and, I, and one that I saw several uh, folks ask was, will this webinar uh, be recorded? Absolutely, it's being recorded and just allow us several, uh, a couple of days to package this and send this out to everyone so you can listen to it on demand. So I, I did see that that was the question. Um, all right, so we have a couple of questions here. For live remote proctoring, can we uh, take this in a local library? No, you're going to want to be able to um, take it in a secure private location, a home uh, where there is uh, a room that nobody would enter, uh, another secure location like an office where a door could be closed. Uh, no one uh, could, can be in the room, you know, including children or pets, and you will need to do a 360 degree kind of um, room scan. Um, so I would encourage you to visit uh, the area on our website that talks a little bit about the live remote proctoring uh, testing requirements and just see if that is a right fit for you. You will also be in contact with a proctor real time. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there will be that uh, level of kind of conversation and, um, you know, volume there, which is another reason why a private kind of secure location is required. Um, how fast do you get your uh, exam results is another question uh, that we received. Typically, we say between two and three weeks is what we advertise on our website. Um, typically, we, we really do strive to, to exceed that um, advertised expectation, but we do ask for two to three weeks for your official results to get processed. You will receive preliminary unofficial results on screen, whether you're at a testing center or a um, a live remote proctor testing event. Uh, but for those official results, two to three weeks, we ask. Okay. There was another related question. Do we receive a pass or fail instantly after taking the proctor exam, um, the remote proctor exam? Again, 
no matter the modality that you're taking, there will be on-screen unofficial pass-fail results displayed for you. And those official results would follow within two to three weeks. Okay. How does the live remote, um, how does the live remote proctoring work? Do we need to buy an external camera recorder? Um, again, please, I would encourage you to visit the um, uh, technical kind of specification area on our website. I will say that either a built-in uh, camera or an external camera um, on the dedicated machine that you're using would work. Um, but I, I would encourage you to visit the um, website for further specifics on um, all of the technical requirements to, to test from home if that modality is um, of interest to you. Uh, another question, if unsuccessful, how long do we have to wait to retest? Um, you will need to wait for your official results to be processed. Again, two to three weeks is what we advertise. And then at that time, you would be able to um, apply uh, again, and it would be your application would just go back in queue. We would ask then for another two to three weeks. Again, we try to exceed expectation to have your new uh, reapplication process, and you would get then a new 90 day um, eligibility period. Okay. What else here can I answer? Okay, so we have a, a, a few questions um, about eligibility, great eligibility questions. We have a stellar certification services team um, that, uh, that will be able to reach out to you with a response. We, we do feel that any eligibility question deserves such personal attention from our staff. So we'll make sure to contact any of you that have specific eligibility questions um, with a, a, a follow-up response. Um, where can we register for the proctor test. So when you visit pncb.org, if you haven't already, you do need an account kind of set up with us. Once you log in, anybody can create an account. Once you log in, there are going to be quick links in a navigation area where you would be taken to any of our exam applications. And in that same area, you'll see a, a very visual choice to apply for the CPN exam at a testing center or the CPN exam via live remote proctoring. And the application process works just the same. Um, another question is asked, what is the amount of time needed to register prior to taking the uh, test? So this is kind of a, I'll give you some general timelines, but it's kind of a personal choice. Um, from the moment you apply, so let's say you apply today, allow two to three weeks for our uh, staff to review your application and um, you know, deem your application eligible. Um, from that moment when you're made eligible, you, you'll then receive a 90 day eligibility uh, period or window. In the 90 days, you're able to then create a testing appointment. So you could apply today, in two weeks, your application gets approved, and then you could choose to set up an appointment at the very tail end of that 90 days if you wanted, you know, several more months to, um, you know, prepare using your personalized study plan. Um, what other answers here? Give me one moment as I as I scroll through. You have a lot of great questions. Um, will we receive a certificate or a document stating that we have achieved certification? So if you are successful in your CPN exam testing attempt with your um, official results that come to you within two to three weeks, um, you do receive a, uh, a letter, you know, notifying you of the successful results, um, as well as um, a PNCB wallet card indicating your day of um, earning the certification and your expiration date as well. You can also choose to order a, uh, a wall certificate that, that has that same great information on it. A question about our no pass, no pay program and how does the no pass, no pay program work? Um, does the employer have to initiate this? Um, so we have a great no pass, no pay team. Um, yes, it's it's organization or hospital, you know, based. They have to, you know, uh, be part or sign up for the program. But it's essentially um, 
you know, that employer organization would not pay until the, the nurse passes. There's other details about it. I, um, and we can follow up with you or your employer to provide them with additional information. Um, and we have a great, again, no pass, no pay uh, team that supports that uh, effort and helps organizations and employers understand the benefits of that program. Okay. Is there a discount uh, from multiple retesters? I'm thinking perhaps just if you have to retest more than one time. So there is um, there is a reduced fee if you're reapplying. So do check pncv.org for, for current um, pricing or fees, excuse me, associated with um, first time applying and retesting. Yes, um, there is, as somebody mentioned, there is a discount code for SPN members. Absolutely, yes, that's that's very true. So in the application process, um, you can certainly indicate that and you have to present your SPN card, but absolutely, thank you for that reminder or shout out as it were. Okay, uh, another question when a nurse um, passes, are they sent instructions for maintaining or renewing their certification? Absolutely. So in that successful letter or successful notification, which tells that nurse when their you know, expiration date is for the certification that they just earned, it does you know, mention that there is an annual recertification uh, or certification, certification maintenance program and gives some preliminary information. Our amazing um, marketing and certification services team do take care as well to um, provide reminders as that first recertification period um, begins to uh, arrive for a newly certified person. Give me one more minute here while I'm looking at for some other questions. I wanted to go back quickly to the um, question about, you know, does a nurse, what does a nurse get if they pass the exam? So they get the letter, they get the wallet card, and I, I misspoke the wall certificate that is automatically, um, you know, sent to the nurse at no charge. So I wanted to just clarify that as well. Okay. Bear with me as I scroll through some of your great questions. We do want to uh, get to as many of these as possible. So thank you for hanging in here with us. Okay, another question is asked, how many questions must we get right to pass and how long do we have to complete the test? So completing the test, the duration of the whole testing event is three hours. You have three hours to answer 175 questions. This does not include, uh, you get another 15, 17 minutes for the tutorial at the beginning, and then another uh, handful of minutes to do an optional evaluation at the end. But truly that three hours um, is for the 175 questions. So in terms of how many questions must you get right to pass, that's not something that PNCB is able to share or advertise. And um, there's this great area on our website about how the exam is scored and the process by which um, you, know, you would see a score is scaled scoring. So the scaled scoring passing point is a number of 400, where if you get no questions correct, your scaled score is 200. If you get all the questions correct, your scaled score is 800. The passing point is right there in the middle at 400. This is done um, you know, so that as we have multiple iterations of a form, um, if there happens to be a couple of harder questions on a particular form, uh, or a couple of easier questions on another particular form, the uh, cut slides accordingly. So it's always at that 400 scale. Um, so again, go to pncb.org's website for more information on scaled scoring. Okay, bear with me just one moment. Uh, do we know why those four or so procedures and interventions were removed from the test, the blood administration, et cetera. Right, so this all goes back to that every um, three to seven years, we average it about five years, job task analysis research, where we put out you know, this 
this national required survey for us to have an accredited exam to all CPN credential holders at the time asking, what do they do in practice? How frequently do they do it? And how important is it? And uh, with each thing, uh, each item that we ask, whether it's tasks, procedures, or interventions, uh, clinical uh, categories, things like that, um, all must be validated by a certain threshold. And if they didn't meet validation any longer, um, then that topic area or procedure or what have you would then fall off of the outline. If nobody's doing it or, or a, 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 a smaller you know, percentage of, of CPNs, practicing CPNs are doing it, uh, again, based on very you know, statistical decision-making, it would then come off. Um, one moment. Okay. What type of requirements are there to keep up the certification if you earn the, the CPN uh, credential? So there's a variety of ways to uh, maintain your certification um, as you would then you know, move into an annual recertification process. Um, and uh, some of them are contact hours that you earn um, anywhere external from, from PNCB, so long as it is related to your CPN role um, and earn within the last 24 months. We also offer modules um, from free, some you know, with a cost that you could use. So contact hours are certainly an option. Clinical practice hours, excuse me, practice hours um, are always an option as well academic credit, um, professional, practice, professional practice linkages, uh, or PPLs, uh, as we call them, um, things like committee membership, uh, national awards, um, poster presentations, authorship, things like that. Um, there's a variety of types of activity that could satisfy that 15 hours required every year for recertification. It's a bit of a mix and match approach. And um, there's always one year as well that you can choose to uh, log a record review year, a year of an activity. Um, and that's, uh, that's that and more information about recertification on our website. Um, how long is the certification valid for? So once you earn it, uh, you have about a year, depending on when you took the test, a year or a year and a half that your wallet card is, is active. Um, it will expire then on February 28th annually. The maintenance program or recertification, you have to recertify annually in order for you to maintain that CPN um, credential. So every year that you recertify, your expiration date then goes out another year and so on and so forth. Okay. Is there, um, I think we have just one more uh, question here. Is there any limit uh, as to how many times that we can try uh, to take the exam? No, there are some limitations if you're involved or participate or your employer or hospital participates in the no pass, no pay program, how many you can within a certain year. Again, please check the website for more information there. But otherwise, no, there's no limit. And you would just need to uh, reapply and go through that same eligibility uh, period. Uh, and let's just take one last question um, as we wrap things up here. And I think there is just one more. Do I have to do the exam again um, you know, for recertification? No, um, as part of maintaining your CPN certification, all of those options that I just kind of rattled off um, a couple of questions ago are ways that you can maintain your CPN um, certification, but retaking the exam is not one of them. You would only need to do that in the event that you let your CPN credential lapse and it's past a point of being able to reinstate it. You would then have to meet, um, you know, initial eligibility requirements if it's for the exam again. All right. Thank you. Thank you for all of these great questions. If you have additional questions, we invite you to email us at any time at exam at pncb.org. Thank you for joining us.